Hey. Let me just... Oh, God. This right here is another month's worth of PR packages. And we're going to rip through them together. And remember, my unboxings are fun. So don't scroll away yet. <laughs> Where do I begin? We're doing an unboxing. Where do I even begin? They're playing Jenga. This cannot be real. You already know the drill. Speed PR haul. Let's go. Um. <gasps> my God. From Bays, we got the medium luggage, carry-on, the mini weekender, and the cute travel case. Dead. Dead. The mystery continues of what's inside these boxes. Welcome to day two out of four. Pile two is ready to be revealed. Reminder that most of this will be given away to some of you guys. If you have been around, you know what this means. This is literally one of my best beer hauls. How is this real? Hey y'all, welcome in or welcome back. Today we're talking about PR. We're talking about how it can be the trap of free stuff. And we're talking about that in the context largely of you, the subscribers. How does this impact you as a viewer? We're going to get there. I usually ask y'all to subscribe at the end of the video, but we're going to do it at the beginning of the video this time. Subscribe. We produce a lot, not we, me, <laughs> I produce a lot of conscious consumer content on this channel. I would love to have you here. If you like this video, if you like that video we did on decluttering, which has been a big hit. We have more videos coming up in May that are going to, I think, hit just as hard. Subscribe. A few weeks ago, my friend Lara made a video on PR and her anti-consumerist take. And so this video is inspired by her and kind of how she got me thinking about PR. And I'm going to link her video in the description. Go watch her channel because she's amazing. I love her and she makes great content. So before we begin this video on PR, I think it's important for me to disclose my own relationship with PR and as well as sponsored sponsorships. So I started getting PR back in 2021 and I accepted it for a very small margin of time, like about a year, year and a half ish. And I accepted PR from a handful of companies, um, Alia Skin being the first, Vivaya and Louisa Merritt, that might be it. It was somewhere around uh, like 2022, end of 2021 maybe, that I was able to get my first sponsorship or I took or accepted, I should say, my first sponsorship. And once I started accepting sponsorships and I, I started hearing more about like small creators views on sponsorships and PR, I basically only started accepting paid work around that point. And I have not accepted any PR since 2022 approximately. The reason why I stopped accepting PR, PR is extended with strings attached. I have never received one offer in the history of my channel, which is about four years, um, that was a no strings attached PR. The company wants you to produce content with it. Usually they want significant control over what that content looks like. My trajectory with PR, I think is quite normal with small creators. And I think as well, the way that I felt at the beginning, having the very first companies send me PR was very exciting. It was like, oh my God, this is so cool. This is amazing. Brands are thinking about me. Brands are reaching out to me. It in some ways kind of validated like in my mind, my like place as a creator. Like I'm up and coming and I'm starting to be real creator now because brands are looking at me. Brands want to work with me. Brands see me as valuable. Hey all, Editing Shana here. I wanted to make a statement before we get into what is a critique of PR. PR on its own isn't inherently a problem and channels and people who accept PR aren't inherently problems either, just like an ad is not inherently a problem either. There are plenty of small businesses or businesses that are doing great things and are giving PR away in a fair manner. Just the same with ads. There are companies that don't require people to make purchases or they're doing great sustainable things. I was recently actually learning about some apps that like help consumers make better buying decisions. And also I've seen ads for search engines like Ecosia as an example. So 
it's not the case that all PR is bad or all ads are bad. It's really about how an influencer, how a channel or a page uses their influence. And it's really about like the context. So I would just like us to keep this in mind as we go through. We are going to talk about small and large uh, creators and their experiences with PR. And you might say like, why even bother with a small creator? But small creators do generate revenue for companies. Companies reach out to small creators because they can get like the most in some ways out of them. They have the smallest cost for like for conversion, really. Like you're just sending these creators a product and that can generate more more sales than maybe a bigger creator, right? If you do this with like, let's say, 10 micro creators, you spend cost of goods and shipping to them and combined, they could potentially sell more than one mid or large size creator who you've paid money to along with product. The trust is better with a smaller creator. The relationship might be better with a smaller creator. And so it's more advantageous for a brand to do this more and then they get more out of it. And then you also, I think in some ways, have more excitement with a smaller creator because they're super excited about these opportunities and about getting PR in ways that a larger creator isn't because that experience isn't new or novel anymore. Like they're they're seasoned. And so it doesn't hit the same. They're not as excited about the product and excitement over products. Colors reviews. Yeah, colors how a person talks about a product. And that coloring is more positive and that can make their audience more likely to buy the thing. And then you also can have this desire for future partnerships. One of the things that brands used to do is they would say like, you do this, like maybe, maybe you'll have paid work in the future. I do feel for small creators because there's not a lot of people there to, to guide them or to help them navigate these processes and mistakes can be made. And this excitement over getting free stuff or working with brands for the first time, maybe brands that you've wanted to try or like you've looked up to, they reach out to you and you can be so excited about the product or the opportunity that, yeah, that thought doesn't go into whether you want to influence your audience in that way. This also goes for large creators. The The thought process behind accepting sponsorships is selfish or more selfish, right? Like you're thinking primarily or perhaps exclusively about yourself. I'm not saying this is the case 100% of the time or that creators put no thought into their audience. It's the audience who I think is impacted the most. I'm not trying to insult small creators, nor am I trying to say I'm above it because my very first PR offer, I signed away content rights. I think what I'm trying to say here is that small creators and large creators aren't immune to considering their needs and their desires over their audience. But no matter what people say, you are colored even to a small extent by the thing being free. And I look back at the Alia skin video, which is private, by the way, you can't see it. I was trying to call a product mediocre and I did eventually say it, but I was like, this product didn't work for me. But like my mom loved it. And I said, she loved it four or five times. Or if you, if you look at my empties videos, I think that's more of a, that's more of an accurate reflection of how I talk about products. I'm like, yeah, it was mediocre. It was fine. It was okay. I have no stake in what that company thinks of me or if they watch that video. I have no stake. If I call CeraVe sunscreen garbage or it was awful or it didn't work or it was terrible, I say that like with my full chest because that's what I honestly think and because I have no relationship with CeraVe. Would it be cool to work with CeraVe like even on a theoretical level? Sure. You like you think about your words differently when you're sponsored or when you're doing PR. I thought that because I could be honest or I could share that something was mediocre meant that like I was above being influenced by PR. No, it like it, it changes stuff, even at a small level. And I think about PR very differently now where I put my 
subscribers needs above mine, right? Like, would they benefit from this product? Would they benefit? Would you benefit from this advertisement from me selling to you? And even though it's PR, right? It, it's not sponsorship. I'm not getting paid. I'm still selling you something or I'm putting something in front of you that you would never have known otherwise, most likely. Or sometimes it is, it is stuff that you've heard about, but you're, you're not currently thinking about it. And small creators, they have influence. I have a couple of, of videos that I made from PR that like collectively have about 10,000 that I made two to three years ago. And the company made money off of me. And not just that, not just the company made off of me, more importantly for you, I brought that content to you. I put these brands and companies to you, stuff that you probably would never have heard of if I wasn't taking PR. And I bet you there are thousands of videos from small creators who have made content, I'm not saying from these specific brands, but people who have made content and are effectively selling and reviewing products to their audience. And people can say all they want, like, oh, small creators are small, they don't have influence. They have, sure, they have less influence from than a large creator, but if they had no influence or the influence didn't matter, nobody would be reaching out to them or us. I'm still very much a small creator. Nobody would be reaching out to us. And then when you look at things in a collective point of view, you look at all the thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of videos at this point from small creators who've made videos from PR, it, like it can add up. And I think that the brands are more nefarious than anything here because when you put a PR product in front of in front of somebody and then you also demand a contract or you also demand deliverables, you are getting away with producing the exact same kind of content, sponsored content, unsponsored and doesn't need the same level of disclosures as sponsorships do by law. PR is a different trap for small creators than large creators. And the way it's a trap for small creators is that you're producing de facto sponsorships for brands or without the same disclosures. And then you are influencing your audience in the very same way as a sponsored content. You are bringing reviews and sharing stuff with pressure and with expectation without always disclosing the pressure and the expectation. And then all of the excitement because small creator doesn't get a lot of PR colors that review and makes it more positive. I really believe that small creators aren't sharing stuff that they think is garbage. Like, I don't think that's happening, but there's some stuff you like, you can come across even more excited and tempt your viewers even more because you're so excited. And now we're talking about big creators now. When big creators get PR, they might not want to slam products because they like don't want to slam stuff that they got for free, number one. Number two, they might want to stay on PR lists. Like if you're routinely calling Lanesh products garbage, why would Lanesh continue to send you stuff? So you aren't that critical of PR, then they'll keep sending you stuff. And if you say nothing, you just like show it or you use it, that could be enough to keep you on a PR list. And quite frankly, there are some channels who are sent so much PR, they don't do any reviewing of it. They just unbox it or use it because they they just couldn't produce enough videos reviewing all the stuff that they got. And it probably isn't their best interest to review all the stuff that they got. This is part of why PR unboxings kind of bother me <laughs> because they're drumming up excitement for products that they've never even tried. I was watching some stuff on TikTok recently and I was seeing unboxings and these women were like, oh my God. And they were like freaking out and they were so excited about stuff. You know, they're like, oh my God, it's so amazing. It's so cool. Thank you, Lanesh, for sending me these products. You get your audience excited about it. You can get them hooked on the product or hooked on your like on you, they like that you're excited. For these large creators, PR allows them to create large volumes of a large volume of content and do that for free. Creators can get sent so much stuff that like they'll never run out of ideas. And I think that it facilitates a certain kind of video. I think it facilitates the try-ons and the reviews. Because it entices a creator 
to do this style of video when they are not spending their own money. I can see the thought process be like, why would I pay money to review that product or do that kind of video when I could do this kind of video for free? I don't totally blame the content creator here because I think some of their reaction is natural. They like the free stuff. I like free stuff. And so if they're a big enough creator, all of this free PR is just kind of like this constant machine right? Unless you put a stop to it, you're, it's just going to keep going and going and going. It's like this endless well of ostensibly free content. This benefits the creator because they get to produce content that is free and that's easy, right? Like if you have a constant supply of stuff, you could go in there any old day, pick out some stuff and make a video. Or maybe like you've just established a process for creating videos that is based on this, like this routine that you've established. But this also means that you as a viewer are going to continue seeing the exact same kind of content and having or a creator will have the same level of influence or same type of influence on you for however long it happens. This benefits the creator because they get to stay in the algorithm. Companies are typically not sending products that were popular five years ago. They're sending the newest stuff, the newest releases or products that are popular right now. Elf right now, like on, on their website, or at least maybe like late last year, they had this like popular on TikTok section. And some of the products in that section were new. Some of them were older. So they send a creator a box of this kind of stuff. You could talk about, oh yeah, this is viral on TikTok right now. Because sometimes viral stuff is not the newest stuff. They're producing content that's on trend using new and trendy products. So that helps, that helps their videos get clicks. And I think that this kind of process stunts thinking a little bit. And I'm not trying to imply that a creator thinks nothing about their content. I say that this stunts thinking because it can create habits and because it can create comfortability when things are working. When something's working for you, think about in school, or at work with a relationship, you tend to just keep doing more of the same because more of the same is working, right? Like they're making money, they're getting visibility, they're getting traction, they're getting clicks, they're getting the comments, their viewers seem to be happy. Why change when whatever recipe you have right now is perfectly fine? The problem with that is people get comfortable. People will continue to make the same kind of content, the same kind of video, but I think this can prevent them from thinking, what kind of impact do I want to have? Is this the impact that I want to have on my audience? Is this the kind of influence I want to have on my audience? How do I feel about selling products? How do I feel like selling products benefits my audience or maybe doesn't benefit them? And I'm not saying that that thinking is inherently going to have somebody come to the exact same conclusions that I come to, but I think that that thinking isn't happening because complacency happens because them like it's just like the machine that's at work right like it's just in the process it's just chugging along and i think this is more inclined to happen when the audience likes what's happening i can be very critical of influencers and i think there's a lot of problems that influencers perpetuate and fuel but this is a dynamic as well audience fuels a lot of what's happening it's not just one-sided influencers are <laughs> shit problematic people who can do no right and are just like 100 of 100% of the blame and onus is on them. No, it's like a symbiotic relationship with their audience. Audience can demand content. Their audience can demand links. Their audience can have expectations of them. And also what I've seen on TikTok in specific also sometimes on YouTube, audience will be like, what do you think about this? What do you think about this? And they want to know the opinion of an influencer, of their specific influencer that they really love. Maybe they have a couple. There's some people out there who are the it girls and people follow these it girls because they want to have lives like them. They want to have aesthetics like them. They want to have, yeah, they want to have lives like them or they want to look like them or they want to use the same products that they like because they see value in their opinion. And also like they'll see an it girl as an it girl because she's in the know. She knows what the, what the popular products are, what the trending popular or what the trending products are. The it girl 
can't know what's in the know, can't know what the trending products are without being sent those products in PR. And I do think that some companies can manufacture virality with PR, right? Like imagine I have a lipstick and also let's imagine that I'm in a company that has like a good marketing budget. I send my lipstick to 10,000 influencers. All of a sudden, 10,000 influencers are unboxing this lipstick, using this lipstick. Maybe my lipstick is from like a known reputable brand. So that inclines them to try it more than like some random brand they've never heard of. And so now all of a sudden, all these influencers, some of them it girls are trying my lipstick and are loving it. And you're seeing my lipstick everywhere, which can give the impression of virality. But really all I've done is just sent my product to a lot of people. Hey y'all, I wanted to add in a couple more thoughts here. I've been watching more TikTok PR unboxings and I've come to really realize that these videos are like the unboxing is the video. There was a time and a place, most especially on YouTube, when you would unbox the stuff to then review the item, right? Like I have now these products that I can go and review. And there's probably some of that that is still very much happening. But on TikTok, more than ever, the unboxing is the video. That's the content. Like just, just, just let that sink in for a second. Company is sending somebody a product just for it to appear in an unboxing. And that can be enough to sell a product because a product now can be associated with a creator, especially if they're excited about it. Like I, I'll just, I'll just use myself as an example. So I'm not throwing more creators names in here. I love Shauna so much. She loves the Dior lip oil. She was so excited to unbox it, or it just has an association with Shauna's name that my name that they want to go and buy it too. And now there's just like all of this stuff that is in the background that they can use for videos or just let's say do their makeup with it or just wear it or travel with it. And, and, and that stuff is now linkable, right? Like you might now be using some luggage from a brand and you don't ever bring a review on the luggage, but the luggage is now being tagged as this thing that this person uses. And then also the person can make affiliate commissions off of it and they're selling the product. <laughs> it's not even about like associations anymore, right? Like this girl's an it girl, so we want the product to be associated with her. That definitely plays a role in some cases, but in other cases, the person now has products that they can link and that they can make money off of. There's so many layers to PR that people don't think about. And this is kind of the entire point of PR. PR is sent to influencers, one, because their opinion matters, but also it's not really about the influencer. It's about people buying the product. It's about you. It's about the subscriber. It's about the viewer. Yeah, they will hope that you'll showcase the product and that you'll use the product, but what they want is for you to do it in a way that entices the viewer to buy the thing. Sometimes that's using it. Sometimes that's raving about it. Sometimes that's just like showing that you own it and that's enough. A creator is sent so much stuff because of their audience. Their audience is their power. You are their power. This kind of relationship with PR bloats people's collections. You know, you're just... Influencers get more stuff and more stuff and more stuff and more stuff. Then maybe they use it once or twice and it normalizes owning large quantities of stuff and then also get ridding, getting rid of that stuff. And it normalizes large collections of stuff and just owning a lot of stuff. Like makeup collections are so big, wardrobes are so big, it can make it seem this is what owning makeup looks like. This is what being a person, this is what a wardrobe looks like. This is what being a makeup lover, makeup user, makeup wear, that's what it, this is what it is. This is what being a makeup user and lover looks like. The Alex drawers had everybody buy a chokehold 
And like the Alex drawers, they extended beyond the influencer YouTuber to the everyday consumer because this is what the YouTuber uses. This is what owning a makeup collection and storing it looks like. And then it normalizes not finishing products too. I have an entire video on the declutter, which is, you know, one of my most popular videos on the channel. And when we're buying stuff and then using it a couple of times, that that is so normal, right? And then the declutter is even more normal. You have to declutter at such high frequencies if you are going to accumulate in such high frequencies too and not become a hoarder. It normalizes decluttering being the sole way or the main way of stuff leaving your home. Normalize is not using stuff up, not having a desire to use stuff up, use stuff up. This is facilitated by PR. A lot of these influencers could have never gotten into the money or the position that they are in without the PR, without being able to have all of this content at their disposal to produce. Then they make money off of it. And then, you know, the cycle continues. And sure, eventually they have money to buy literally whatever they want. But a lot of getting to where that is happened on the back of PR. It can be very easy to forget that a creator's main income, the thing that they do to earn their money is to influence. Their job is to entice you to buy new things to make you excited about new things, make you excited about the new clothing launches, the new planner launches, and the new beauty launches. If you weren't excited about the makeup community, if you weren't excited about the planner community and the planner launches, why would you keep up on them? There's an entertainment value that is baked into somebody's content that like has to be there on some level in order for you to keep watching them and also want to stay afloat of this topic or this brand or this niche. I kind of bring up the job component because influencers, what they do is they turn themselves into a brand. We think about concepts like brand loyalty and brand trust when it comes to to products like individual products, like the phones that we own or the cleaning supplies that we use, we have brand trust and brand loyalty. An influencer wants the same thing out of you. And they do that by turning themselves into the brand. And we can almost not notice. And we almost don't think about Shauna Rapari as the brand or Laura Lee as the brand but she is the brand. And when we kind of think about it like that, it's much easier to see that she has a vested interest in making her content entertaining or any influencer. I don't want to pick on Laura Lee, but an influencer making their content entertaining, engaging, and having you trust them, having you trust their opinion, having you see them as reputable or knowledgeable, or maybe just fun because you trust them. You find them entertaining you come back to their videos and you buy their stuff. They want you to think that way so they can continue to make money off of you. And I think PR facilitates some of the out of touchness that can happen. Like if a like when creators gets big enough, they may never have to buy another beauty product if they didn't want to. And they can go to the stores less and They don't have to make decisions about prioritizing their budget because budget isn't a factor anymore. Cost isn't a factor anymore. They don't have to consider how long somebody has to work in order to buy that thing. And this, I think, comes across in recommendations. Like recommending a $90 face palette is like you're not perhaps not saying totally true. You're recommending a $90 face palette that's easier to do when you have it you get it for free, but it's also easier to do when you don't have to worry about money. When you don't have to worry about, all right, I get paid $30 an hour. How many hours do I have to work in order to buy the palette? Is this palette a useful like use of my money? These things are factored far less. Like the practicality day-to-day everyday people that they face are factored in much less to reviews like the bigger the creator gets. And we're just considering things like quality. I mean, val- and that's like where it can become hairy to to talk about things like value for money. Because like, regardless of 
what kind of job you have. There are people who have money out there. There are people who don't. And it's hard for me to say like what's value for money because I'm one person who makes a certain amount of money. You're not going to value stuff in the same way as me, even if we make the same amount of money. I really believe that PR impacts content and consumption more than the average person or average viewer realizes. PR has such impact on consumer culture and overconsumption than I think we give credit for. Imagine, imagine the scenario where our all PR was stopped for a year. Just like imagine how that might play out. Imagine the kind of content that creators would choose to produce if they were buying things themselves or if they were at least not getting free stuff, I really think the landscape would change. PR is a cog in the wheel of consumerism. Jen Phelps is a makeup content creator. She has about 170,000 subscribers. Her YouTube banner says unsponsored reviews. And she says, she says that in videos too. Like you can come onto my channel for like unbiased or unsponsored reviews, or at least the idea of unbiased is intertwined with this idea of unsponsored. She gets a ton of praise for not doing or receiving sponsorships. However, she still accepts PR. And she used to do a series of the Sunday haul where she would show all the stuff that she gets in in a given week like as it comes in. And then sometimes she'll do like an unboxing of it or she always does unboxings of it. But then at the end end of the video, she might use like a handful of those products on her face, depending on, you know, how much she gets in and what it is. She still like, she still accepts PR. And she used to do this on a weekly or bi-weekly basis. I went actually looking at her channel to see the last time she did this. I think the last time she did it was early January. So it's been a while, but this was a recurring series that she did for a long time. It was interesting to me to see how much praise that she gets for not taking sponsored content, yet having so much PR. And it's the PR that facilitates a lot of the consumption and consumerism around her channel. She still has the ability to impact you whether she accepts PR or sponsorships. Her impact level is the same. If all she's doing is producing reviews and try-ons. And I think her channel is really indicative of a lot of other niches. In the in the planner community, it's less common there to have directly sponsored videos, but the bulk of their channel and their ability to post at their frequency is because they get so much in PR. PR is seen as more benign than ads, more ethical than ads, and I think less influential than ads. I get it. Ads are more overt. You're directly telling an audience to buy something or to consider buying something. I also understand how it can be super annoying to watch a content creator who has 12 videos a month, have eight of them be sponsored. We talked about Jessica Braun a couple weeks ago and you know she isn't on PR list anymore, but her ability to impact you and your consumption is still the same. And she also still accepts ads. So I'm not trying to say that like PR is the only problem or PR is inherently the devil. PR, in my opinion, aided her to get to her position that she's in now where she now has the ability to buy whatever she wants. And PR is a cog in the wheel of consumerism, but it's not the only way that consumerism happens. I feel like just need to balance that out a little bit there. She stopped accepting PR because she was overwhelmed on an individual level, not necessarily because getting PR was better for her audience. I mean, she did think about that in some respects because she spoke about how she wanted more control over the kind of content that she produced and the kinds of products that she was showcasing. But this didn't automatically lead to like, how am I influencing my audience? What kind of influence do I want to have? Or this desire to not influence. The slope gets more slippery um, when we think about disclosures. And Lara mentioned the problem with disclosures in her video. And to be honest, I, I hadn't spent the type of time that she spent thinking about disclosures. She brought, she brought up a really, she brought up really great points. Somebody can use something in their video, haul it, right? Like they do PR haul or they 
maybe they're doing a foundation review and they mentioned in that one video that the foundation is was sent in PR. Then they use that foundation for six more months or maybe they use it four times over the next year, but they never again mention that this was in PR. This can lead people to think that this person likes this product or because they're using it so much or because they never disclose it ever again, that they bought it. And then if you're using it, you can imply, okay, they bought it, they like it, they're using it. Sometimes stuff just shows up in the background and like you just see stuff hanging around. There's stuff in my background, right? Like you can see there's a purse there, actually a bag there. I think my Teddy Blake bag is right there. I mean, it's not a focal point. I don't think you can really see it if you're looking for it. But either way, it's still there, right? I have a mirror there. I have a plant there. Imagine if I like had all this stuff sent to me in PR. There are some home decor channels where that's true. I have a, a light there. What if that was sent to me in PR? And it's in my background all the time. And also, what if I put links to those things in my description? I have a mirror linked. I have a light linked. In my description, get the look. You would never know <laughs> that this was PR by that kind of setup. So I'm allowing, like I'm facilitating you buying more stuff with also the implication that I like the stuff. Let's pretend in this scenario, all the stuff is PR and it's in my background. There is an implication that I like this enough because it's around. However, would I have bought this myself? Would these be the items that I would have bought to display and own in my home if they weren't sent in PR? The bigger the creator, the bigger the influence, right? The more power that they have, the more purchasing power that they have via their audience, the more influence that they exert. However, imagine, just imagine you have somebody with, I don't know, 4 million subscribers who has large impact, who decides to change things up. Imagine that impact. I'm not trying to say that everybody who ever accepts PR is a hot pile of garbage or everybody who accepts ads are just shitty people. Not all ads are created equal. Not all content is created equal. Not all creators are created equal. And I think perhaps Lara is onto something that we could really benefit from more disclosures. And I know that like I wear jewelry all the time that is like stuff that was sent to me. And I don't think about disclosing that this was sent to me. I also realized in making this video that I have old links just there. My description box like can automatically be copied from video to video and I haven't gone and edited the links in there in a long time. And so maybe I just remove all of my links. And so like, even if I am wearing jewelry, you will not know where it's from because it's not linked there. Disclosures can be made, right? Like all Ana Luisa jewelry that has ever been shown on this channel or ever could be shown on this channel up until this point was sent in PR or was part of a sponsorship video. Like th there are things that are possible. And he I think here's also the thing. If you're somebody who links new stuff for each video, you can add, and this is what some people do do. This was sent to me in PR or like this like asterisk means it was sent in PR. So you know, as a potential consumer, what, what's coming where. Or like if you buy something that this was sent to the creator in PR. It's not, it's not always clear though. I was thinking about some channels um, in the planner community and they show new releases from creators all the time. I would say like probably two to six times a month, they're showing new releases. And they don't say anything like, this brand sent this to me. They'll say like, Shauna's Paper Shop like has a new release or there's a new release from Shauna's Paper Shop. And the first part of the video, what they're doing is they're flipping through the book, the sticker book or whatever, the planner. And then the second part of the video, they plan with it. There's no review there. They're not saying, I think this is good quality. I think you should buy this, which is interesting. And I think that happens because many of these brands are owned by people that they're friends with. And influencer and creator brands money the water even more. There are many big makeup creators who have 500,000 subscribers, a million, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten million, 10 million. Um, and they have their own brands. And then they send products to other people in the space that are their peers maybe people that they're friends with. How does that not color your review? How does that not affect what you say? I think about myself. I'm one person. Not everybody is me. 
I think about people who I've had um, just a modicum of interaction with. I think about, let's say, Sarah Rose, talking about her locks, I love her. Let's say she releases her own brand or she has a collab palette. I want her to be successful, right? Like I want, I want her to... To, to be successful in whatever endeavors that she decides to to do. That would impact what I would say from her or what I would say about that kind of collab because I like her. I think she's great. I think she's a person who's genuinely trying to do good work out here and I'd want her to be successful. I don't know how I could give a fair, like unbiased review. I'm thinking that maybe something like disclosures or conflict of interest statements might be helpful. This is something that happens in science papers all the time where you have to disclose like where you got money from, who funded your study, and also potential conflicts of interest. And you can call them potential conflicts of interest because it doesn't mean that there is a conflict of interest. So if I was, if it was me and I was making this said video on Sarah Rose's new company, I could say there's a potential conflict of interest here. I really like her. There's a potential conflict of interest here, but I think that there are still steps that can be taken to mitigate conflict of interest um, and be more honest and more forthcoming about our relationship with PR and free stuff as, you know, creators on the internet. And people who don't want to be honest and forthcoming about their influence, it's a bit sus. So that's the video. That's my take on PR and how I think it can be a problem and how it can be this trap that draws you in with the free stuff, but has a lot of wider implications. I'd like to know your thoughts in the comments below. So do that. Let me know. Thanks for watching and hanging out. And I hope to see you again around here soon.